Thanks for coming along on this, uh, this hot summer night, or spring night, um, to hear Julie and Lisa, who's, Lisa is making a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. He was here last in 2016, shortly before he entered federal politics. I'll introduce him briefly. He studied arts and law, worked as a clerk for a high court judge, worked in business and tertiary institutions in the law, and of course the member for Barara since 2016. Now, as you know, we've had a series of discussions on The Voice. Julie and Lisa spoke about this topic broadly defined in 2016, along with uh, uh, Damien Freeman is here tonight and, and, and others. We've had George Williams and Chris Merritt here. We've had Frank Brennan, Warren Mundine and Joe Hildebrand in various groups. Um, Louise Clegg and Greg Craven and Karen Little a week or so ago. And so on this tonight, we've got Julie and Lisa, who's putting a different proposition to what Senator Little did. And of course, we've also had uh, Sean Gordon, uh, Ed Gordon and Anthony Dillon. So we've had a lot of people here. But tonight, we've got Julie and Lisa speaking on the voice to Parliament. Julian, you're very welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jared. May I begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. We gather here today on what is the first day of pre-poll in New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and the ACT. And I particularly want to have a shout out to the YES volunteers in the Barara electorate. Um, it's been a stinking hot day and it was wonderful to see the YES volunteers buying icy poles and handing them out to both people on the YES uh, campaign and the NO campaign as well. It's a small reminder that we're always at our best when we look beyond labels and see each other's humanity. Can I say it's wonderful to be here with Jared and Anne and all of you at the Sydney Institute. Um, as Jared said, uh, I spoke uh, at the Institute for the last time in 2016, um, before I entered Parliament, about an idea called The Voice and how it could be a means by which Australia could achieve constitutional recognition for Indigenous Australians. I've never hid my advocacy um, for The Voice uh, as an important mechanism for constitutional recognition. And it says something about the Sydney Institute uh, that you engage uh, with issues long before they reach the centre of political debate. Uh, you understand that it's ideas and debate that ultimately shape the country, and it's what Jared and Anne have devoted their lives to. I recently spoke at the Bradfield dinner about the Liberal Party, and I quoted Jared's Menzies Child, written in 1994 for the 50th anniversary of the Liberal Party. 30 years on, Jared's observations about conviction, values, as well as political organisation and professionalism are as relevant today as they were then. Now, the Sydney Institute brings together an eclectic group of Sydney siders who have if I may say, more than a perfunctory uh, interest in our history, the forces that we shape and the forces that shape us. Through history and its retelling, we can see patterns and trends emerging and re-emerging again and again. I recently read a speech by Sir John Gorton, uh, shortly after he became Prime Minister, where he was reflecting on the powers, the new powers that were given to the Commonwealth in the 1967 referendum. Gorton said, and he was using the language of his time, and I quote, we are all of us trying to do our best to advance our Aboriginals, and I believe we can do this between us in an atmosphere of goodwill and irrespective of whether we're using a state or a federal power. And he said that despite progress, Aboriginal advancement was impeded. While much has changed since 1968, we still see a corollary today, a sense of goodwill, a sense of a willingness to act and a frustration at the rate of progress and a gap in the attainment that stubbornly does not close. As we did in 1967, we again looked to our founding document to see if in it we can lay the foundation for real and meaningful change. Noel Pearson's made the observation that the Constitution is a document that deals with power, the division of powers between the Commonwealth and the states, the separation of powers between the Parliament, the executive and the courts, and the use of power to raise a defence force or to tax citizens. In so many ways, the Constitution, that sparse document, has served our country incredibly well. Australia is one of the oldest continuous democracies on earth. A democracy that on most measures delivers, delivers Australians some of the best living standards in the world and which allows Australians to live together as one nation regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, faith or sexual orientation. We're more than a free people, we're a fair people as well. We have a constitution crafted in Australia by Australians for Australia. It's a constitution that created one people out of six, out of six separate states, 
establishing the only nation on earth that, it, that spans an entire continent. The framers called Australia a commonwealth, a word that speaks of our shared destiny. And yet, despite the magnificence of its achievement, our constitution remains incomplete because it's effectively silent about the first peoples of this land. The Uluru Statement from the Heart says, and I quote, we seek constitutional reforms to empower our people to take a rightful place in our, in our country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. And yet, in one of the most livable, prosperous, advanced and successful nations on earth, Indigenous Australians are not sharing in its bounty. Indigenous Australians are living on average eight years less than other Australians. This is a gap experienced against the, across the gambit of medical diseases and conditions. Take, for example, rheumatic heart disease, a childhood disease that effectively stymies the development of the heart. It's a disease most usually found in countries with extreme poverty, but it is as much a part of the medical landscape for Indigenous Australians as the red earth is part of the physical landscape. And then there's diabetes, a manageable disease in a place like Sydney, Melbourne or Perth, or in any of our cities, yet the lower limb amputation rate for an Indigenous person is almost four times higher than that for other Australians, with the highest rates found in remote and very remote communities. Then we turn to things that you and I almost take for granted, like jobs, a roof over our heads, safe homes, reliable schooling for our children, sanitation and running water. In employment, the unemployment rate for an Indigenous person is up to nine times that of other Australians. One in two Austra Indigenous Australians live at or below the poverty line. In other words, they live off $500 a week or less. It's one in two. One in five Indigenous households are living in accommodation that doesn't meet an acceptable standard, with no kitchen or sanitation. The suicide rate for Indigenous Australians is two and a half times that of the rest of the population. We know that for too many Indigenous women and children, their lives are not safe, with a sense of powerlessness, poverty, alcohol and violence doing untold damage in households and to future generations. Here in New South Wales, an Indigenous woman is 30 times more likely to be a victim of domestic violence than a non-Indigenous woman. And across Australia, an Indigenous boy is more likely to go to jail than to university. We've heard it said many times that this referendum is peripheral to the economic challenges facing this country. Fl frankly, it's never peripheral or non-essential to debate and engage around the issues of health, education, jobs, welfare and the safety of Australians, no matter who they are. I don't accept the argument that it's peripheral business for our country, because if it is, we're simply recreating the great Australian silence that says out of sight, out of mind. It's as false as the argument in this campaign that Aboriginal people are privileged and this referendum is about special treatment and creating two different classes of Australians. What concerns me about this argument is not that it's hopelessly false, it's the total absence of empathy for our Indigenous brothers and sisters. It feels like the first ripples of an American-style politics imported into our country. Why does it matter? Because that political culture across the left and right has turned the once great bastion of freedom and liberty in the history of our world, the United States, into a nation engaging in a cold civil war, splitting communities and even families, and we're seeing ripples of it here. We've already seen this here on the left, with an indifference and, a, and indeed a yearning to antagonise people of faith, even to the point of nationalising a Catholic hospital for no other reason than it was Catholic. And on the right, we see similar ways of labelling and dismissing people, just declaring them woke, because if someone's woke, you don't have to engage with their arguments. Those American-style ripples are damaging the shared project that is Australia. On this, both the left and right are forsaking a willingness to persuade where there's difference and the discomfort that that can entail for the comfort of staying in lockstep with a base. All of us must take care in this referendum campaign not to damage our unique Australian political culture. The opening statement of our constitution declares the great national achievement which that document ushered in. It is that the people agreed to unite. Federation was an act of trust, an act of unity, where the shared project was to create one united people out of six different peoples. And the arguments run against the creation of this Commonwealth are arguments that the no cases dusted off for this referendum. Australians were told in the 1890s 
that federation would abolish majority rule because the small states would get the same representation as the big states. Australians were told that by giving states with vastly different population sizes the same number of senators, that the colonies would lose their sovereignty and independence. As well, they were told a vast new bureaucracy would seize control of everything. The country would be wound down in red tape and voting yes would result in the establishment of an unfair but permanent constitution. The only argument we didn't hear was that celebration of ignorance, if you, devote, if you don't know, vote no, a slogan that even fair-minded uh, no voters feel deeply uncomfortable with. Our national project has always been one that seeks to be bigger and fairer. And this referendum is an opportunity to continue that and to build on it. When I read the Uluru Statement from the Heart, I hear a deep yearning to be part of a democratic project, a yearning to be one people, not only in name, but in heart and soul as well. There's the beautiful aspiration I read earlier, that our children will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. This yearning to be one people is something we must nurture, encourage and indeed celebrate. It's an affirmation of our Australian story that has three parts. One, Indigenous heritage spanning millennia, our British constitutional foundation and inheritance, and our great multicultural character. That's why Uluru is not a declaration of war, as one no advocate has argued. Rather, it's an invitation to engage. And the process which led to the voice has been a serious attempt to engage with constitutional conservatives. I approach issues relating to the constitution as a long-standing constitutional conservative. Traditionally, on debates for constitutional change, you will find me on the no case, and my history is a reflection of this. At the age of 20, I was an elected delegate to the 1998 Constitutional Convention on the Republic. I was a delegate for the No Republic cause. John Howard subsequently appointed me to be a member of the formal No Committee for the 1999 referendum. I've been an associate to a High Court Justice, a deeply conservative judge, whose portrait sits in my parliamentary office as a reminder about all I seek to be. As a lawyer and a parliamentarian and a former shadow attorney general and as a conservative, I see my work as protecting what we have. I remain a staunch opponent of a Bill of Rights and of judicial activism. I believe that policy decisions are best left to the democratic process rather than to activist judges seeking some form of immortality through activist causes. The reason I'm opposed to judicial activism is because it fundamentally is undemocratic and undermines public confidence in the judiciary. I believe contested political questions are best left to Parliament. It's the Parliament that should reflect and advance the people's will. It was with this background that I first engaged about a decade ago with Noel Pearson and others about the issue of constitutional recognition. There's a passionate sense of urgency about Noel Pearson. Noel was frustrated at the state of debate about constitutional recognition. He was seeking to understand the perspective of constitutional conservatives and was looking for a way to encourage constitutional conservatives. And so he sought to engage with me, with Greg Craven, with Anne Toomey, with my friend Damien Freeman, who's here tonight, and others on what were our concerns about constitutional recognition. Through these discussions, Noel Pearson came to understand that our constitution is a rule book. It's a practical charter of government, one that creates institutions. Likewise, I too found myself challenged. I found myself being drawn more deeply into reflecting on the genuine aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians to be recognised in their constitution and for this to result in some sort of practical change in the outcomes in the communities that they live and in their lives. Led by Vice-Chancellor Professor Greg Craven, the conversations continued and we listened and argued and brought on board people like Megan Davis and Marcia Langton. Out of those discussions came an idea that went with the grain of our existing constitutional arrangements. The idea wasn't flowery language, which is inconsistent with the dry, sparse, technical nature of our constitution, but an advisory body that would sit with the existing arrangements of our wonderful, our wonderful uh, constitution. The body recognised the supremacy of parliament in our constitutional arrangements and could inform the parliament, as well as the ministers and the public service, about how to implement policies that work with Aboriginal culture and practice and deliver better outcomes on the ground an advisory body that would allow Aboriginal people to be heard on the matters directly affecting them. The idea of a voice that brought people and decision makers closer together was further enhanced when Tim Wilson and Warren Mundine put forward their idea for local and regional voices. Their idea enriched the entirety of our work. Not only a voice to parliament and government, 
but one that could speak through local and regional bodies to public servants, mayors and decision makers. Then rightly, that idea was taken back to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians themselves. This process wound around Australia and concluded at Uluru with a statement from the heart. It was a process of consultation, of engagement and participation that truly embodied the Australian democratic <coughs> ethos, one that's wound its way to this point where all Australians are having a chance to have their say on the proposal. It's worth reflecting a little on that journey and on similar journeys in times past. Over recent months, I've been reading that wonderful book by J.A. Lanoz, The Making of the Australian Constitution. It was published in 1972. It retells the story of the Australia of the 1890s and the path to federation. My staff tease me that the book was never on the bestseller list, but uh, I think it's been a terrific read. And as I've read, I've been struck by a number of things. The imperfect characters, the intrigue, the different pressures from different constituencies, the clunkiness that accompanied much of the discussions on the stop-start nature of progress. But I was struck by something else as well. Not everybody got everything they wanted. In fact, no one did. Federation was a serious engagement in persuasion, negotiation, compromise, re-engaging with constituencies and working with people you don't normally work with. In that context, let me turn to the present. I understand the disappointment of Conservatives and the lack of genuine partnership from the government with the process during 2022 and early 2023. There are many things I wish the government had done differently. I wish Peter Dutton's questions were answered. I wish Mark Dreyfus's counsel to the working group was heeded because his insights about the difficulties of referenda were correct. I wish I didn't have to stand alone in putting an amendment during the debate on the constitutional alteration because I believed it would have made our electoral path easier. And I wish the parliamentary committee process had engaged with my respected colleagues, Keith Wallahan and Andrew Bragg more fully. But none of that matters now, none of it. It truly doesn't and I'll tell you why. One of the learnings I have from public life is no matter what position you hold, none of us ever get everything we want. In this campaign, there are too many conservatives lamenting a process that has passed rather than engaging with the final proposal before us as Australians. What matters here is not the laments, the frustrations and the disappointments with what might have passed. What matters is will this proposal make our country stronger and help the lives of Indigenous people? That's what we have to weigh up and that's what I've weighed up and my answer to that question is yes. This proposal can make our country stronger and make a meaningful difference to the lives of Indigenous Australians. Tonight I want to engage with Australians who are genuinely undecided because this referendum is in your hands. It's not in my hands, it's not in Peter Dutton's hands, it's not in Anthony Albanese's hands. It's in your hands, it's your choice. No person is on the ballot paper at this referendum, no political party is on the ballot paper either. It's only an idea, an idea called The Voice. For those of you who are here who are undecided about what you're being asked to vote on, let me explain how The Voice will work, what we are voting for and why I believe it's a safe change for Australia. So what is The Voice? The Voice will be a committee of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians that will provide advice to the government and the parliament. The people on The Voice will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. They'll come from every state and territory. People on The National Voice will be drawn from the local and regional voice bodies in their communities. Half will be men, half will be women, with spaces reserved for young people and people from remote communities. They'll have a fixed term. The goal of The Voice is to help governments make better decisions better decisions that come from listening to people. Listening can bridge the gaps and improve outcomes. I know as a politician, when I listen to people, I end up making better decisions even when I disagree with them. It's particularly important in Indigenous affairs where in so many places there are cultural differences. The constitutional provision we're voting about is creating a committee that listens to Aboriginal people so it can help governments make better decisions. At the polling booth, we'll all be handed a ballot paper and it will contain a question. A question which says, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve of this proposed alteration? It's a straightforward question and we're being asked to write yes or no in English depending on whether we support or oppose the proposal. Sitting behind this question is a small amendment to the constitution. Let me read and explain it to you. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. That's the constitutional recognition part, something that has been asked for by Aboriginal Australians since the great William Cooper petitioned King George in 1938 to recognise his people in the constitution. 
One, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. That's the guarantee that there will be a committee of some sort to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. That is the only guaranteed power of the, of the Voice. It's power to make representations to the capital P Parliament, which means the Commonwealth Parliament, and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth, which is just a technical way of saying ministers and public servants about matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's the only guaranteed power. Three, and this is the great flexibility and great uh, benefit of this proposal, the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. What all of this means is that the Parliament will still remain supreme in order that it will be able to alter what the voice does from time to time. It won't be able to abolish it, but it will be able to overhaul, reform and change it in accordance with changing circumstances and the needs of the Australian people. This is a small change. At the 1999 Republic referendum, there were 69 proposed changes to the Constitution. That was a massive change. By contrast, this proposal adds just one new section. One of the arguments of the no case at the moment is, this is a whole new chapter of the Constitution. That sounds big, but to quote the no t-shirt, yeah, nah. It's not a big change. The chapter you've just heard is about 100 words, or about a third of a page of text, that's all. It's a small change that will make a big difference. I agree with the former Chief Justice of Australia, the Honourable Robert French AC, and his colleague, Emeritus Professor Geoffrey Lindell AO, who wrote about the provision, the voice is a big idea but not a complicated one. It's low risk for a high return. The voice will provide a practical opportunity for First Peoples to give informed and coherent and reliable advice to the Parliament and the Government. The voice isn't a constitutional monolith. It doesn't interfere with the supremacy of Parliament. As the former Chief Justice of this state, the Honourable Tom Bathurst, ACKC, has said, it has no lawmaking power, it's not an alternative parliament, nor does it in any way limit the constitutional power of the parliament or the powers conferred by parliament on the executive. Any argument to the contrary is, with respect, fanciful. The voice is a safe change, but it's also something more. It's a change that's needed as well. I started this address by quoting Sir John Gorton and sentiments haven't changed over the course of half a century. Despite all of our efforts, we failed to make any real progress on Indigenous health, education, housing, safety and economic advancement. I believe part of the reason is cultural. It's found in the words of the poet, the late Ujuru, who wrote that Indigenous Australians want freedom, not frustration, self-respect, not resignation. For far too long, Canberra and decision makers at the state and local level have made decisions for and not with Indigenous communities, and in so doing have robbed them of the agency that can help their communities flourish. The Voice is about changing this mindset. It's about giving voice and respect to local and regional communities. It's about forsaking a belief that we know best. I believe the disconnect between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia is the root cause of the economic disconnection in Indigenous communities and lives. The voice will help bridge the gap with both. The practical work of the voice is about closing the gap and creating economic opportunity. It's about shifting our focus from looking down to looking up and out, from welfare to jobs, from prisons to universities, empowerment, partnership, respect, and strengthening of Indigenous civic infrastructure. That's how the voice brings change. As a Liberal, I believe in bringing decision-making closer to communities and giving people greater responsibility to shape the policies that affect them. That's what The Voice does. This is a moment of consequence for Australia, a moment will, that will define our country just like the 1967 referendum did. It's a moment that we can choose unity, empathy and a better future. It's a moment where we can make a practical difference to the lives of our fellow Australians. Voting yes offers us a before and after moment for our country. It can be a moment which we're all proud, a moment we can tell our children about. Thank you. So many thanks to um, <clears throat> Julie and Lisa for a, uh, an important and uh, historically reflective speech, uh, but also a contemporary one.
So we come to questions and discussion. I said everyone's got to be brief tonight um, and to the point, but we have plenty of time. So um, <clears throat> a bit, I'll try, a bit like this. Um, you touched on this in your speech, but you mentioned that you had some disappointments. And I guess one of the, the one you didn't specifically say, but we know about was that you didn't want the voice to go to the executive as well as to parliament. You wanted to go to parliament. I think that's right. Now, how does that affect anything? Does it matter? What, what's your response to that? Um, Jared, I want to be, be clear. I, I've always been in favour of the voice advising the executive. And the reason for that is because the executive is where the decisions are made. The executive is the public servants. It's the minister. If it's just advising the parliament, uh, then it's, it, it's not getting to the key decision makers who make decisions that affect their lives. The reason I moved my amendments to remove Clause 2 was because I knew it was a stumbling block for some of my colleagues, but more importantly, it was a stumbling block for voters as I talked to people around, uh, around my constituency and around the country uh, that would prevent people that otherwise might vote yes from voting yes. So my main purpose for moving the amendment, and I made this clear both in the parliament and in uh, discussion around that time, was in order to put the, the voice on a more secure electoral footing and to enhance the prospects of a yes vote. And that's what I've been doing the whole time uh, I've been engaged in this debate, is trying to work out how we get to yes. And I'm continuing to do that. Um, I've always said I would campaign for this whether the government accepted my amendments or not. And that was because the proposal that is before the Australian people is very similar to a proposal that I signed off on, uh, that my friend Damien Freeman signed off on, that Greg Craven, that Anne Toomey, uh, that uh, Noel Pearson, Marcia Langton and Megan Davis signed off on back in 2014. And uh, that included uh, um, uh, providing advice to, uh, to the executive as well. Julian, Tim Abrams, I'm sorry, good, Julian, Tim Abrams, we've spoken often and, uh, and I thank you for um, your presentation. Um, I, uh, I congratulated you on your excellent piece that you wrote in The Australian, where you brilliantly highlighted all the flaws with the voice to Parliament. I'm flummoxed by the fact that notwithstanding those serious flaws, you, and to some extent Father Frank Brennan, agree to support the voice to Parliament. I'd like to know two things. One, your response to Peter Boardman, a left winger who is concerned about introducing race into this debate, that the left have always protected and defended okay, racism. Okay, very what, What's your response to him? And secondly, how does the voice to parliament um, um, improve the lot of the mob? Okay, we got it. Okay. So I think I dealt with the first part, the preamble to your question, saying that my purpose in seeking amendment was to try and encourage more people to vote yes and remove stumbling blocks for people. I'm pleased to ask the question about racial division because I think it's central to the no case and it gives me a chance to address the argument. In 1901, um, the framers of the Constitution put into our Constitution a thing called the race power. It gave the Commonwealth the power to make laws for the people of any race for whom it was deemed necessary to make special laws. It excluded Aboriginal Australians at that point in time. In 1967, we amended the Constitution to give the Commonwealth power to make laws about Aboriginal Australians. 90% of us voted yes in that referendum. It's an extraordinary thing. 90% of Australians couldn't agree on the time of day these days. I mean, we know they can't. Queensland doesn't have daylight saving and they're still an hour behind us. Um, but for that one brief shining moment, Australians agreed in massive numbers. Since 1901, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians are the only group of people that we have ever made laws about on the basis of their race. We don't make laws about Greek Australians, we don't make laws about Italian Australians or Irish Australians or um, Jewish Australians or Sikh Australians or Hindu Australians, but we do make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. And the fruit of those laws is this gap that it doesn't matter who's in, in power, it doesn't matter the resources that are applied to it, it doesn't matter the goodwill, that gap isn't closing. So how's the voice going to help? The voice is going to provide parliament, ministers and the bureaucracy uh, with advice to ensure that the policies that it is putting forward is ground truth in communities. When we're talking about the voice, we're talking about the local, regional and national structures. 
Let me briefly illustrate how I think uh, this would be of benefit. The government is currently in investigating the reform of its remote area um, uh, work for the Dole program, the CDP. It's a program that was roundly criticised. A review has commenced when we were in, uh, we were in office. Um, it's because the program operates very differently in different communities and it's not getting its outcomes. The program needs to operate differently when you're talking about a remote community where there's employment in the general economy a short driving distance away to a community where that's just not an option. And in different communities it needs to operate differently. The voice is about providing advice to the bureaucracy, to the Minister of the Parliament about how we can get better outcomes and how the program can be adjusted on a granular level. That's actually about saving taxpayers money, it's about getting better outcomes, it's about helping closing the gap. Andrew? Uh, we have a federal government, state governments, local governments, committees and commissions. We have, for 25 million people, more governments than you could poke a stick at. Everything that you suggested today, at the beginning of your talk, can be fixed up under those existing laws? Well, the problem is that uh, Australians, uh, when they've gone to make public policy, haven't been listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And because there hasn't been a representative body to provide proper advice in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. And that's why when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were consulted about what they wanted from constitutional recognition, they said they wanted a body that would help provide advice on the policies and laws that affected them. Uh, the fact that this body will be in the Constitution will give it greater standing than some of those other bodies. Many of those other bodies that exist in, um, in the Indigenous policy space are conflicted because they're also bodies that are delivering, delivering services and providing funding for things. The point of the voice is that it won't do that. It will provide advice about how policies get rolled out and, importantly, it will be chosen by Indigenous people, not chosen by governments as bodies and committees that have been established in the past have been. Thank you. Uh, you gave a very good picture and, and, and explained very, very well and in detail why yes and what will happen if, we, if it succeeds. What will be the situation for Australia if the vote is overwhelmingly no? Well, um, I think we, we will just end up with the situation that we have now. Um, the current status quo where we are not addressing the closing of the gap. I mean, you only need to look at the Productivity Commission report of a couple of weeks ago that said that despite the closing of the gap refresh where the Commonwealth and the states and territories are supposed to be working with Indigenous people, that there is still too little attention in, co in terms of the co-design and rollout of the particular programs. The Productivity Commission name-checked the voice and bodies liked it and it said that there was a real prospect that those bodies have a particular role uh, in providing advice and governance in relation to some of those projects. So, you know, this is a, this is a choice that we have, whether we want to see a sea change that will help us close the gap or whether we want to keep muddling through uh, with a situation that gives us poor health outcomes, poor education outcomes, lower life expectancies, higher suicide rates. Um, a vote no is a vote for more of the same. A vote for yes is a vote to change the things that we do structurally in this country in Indigenous affairs. And I think the gap that's existed for far too long indicates that we need to do things very differently. Julian, you make total sense. But having looked at the Federation conventions and going back like you did to the history of the 1890s, you can't really, as some have said, compare Federation with this choice in that we didn't know what we were getting in Federation. In Federation, there were three huge conventions and it was a very close run thing. And the people of Australia were connected by being involved. So if you were to go back and do this again, to what extent did we need to have consultation with all Australians, not just with Indigenous Australians? And could we do that later now, if it does go down? Have we learned from this? And can we do it in a better way in the future? I think the first thing to say, Anne, is I'm campaigning yes. So my, my, my job is to make sure it doesn't go it's down. It's just that there's uh, so much gloom in the news well, I, that I, it's a difficult thing. And we've had very little success with referendums. Could we do it better like the Federation one, which was a very close run thing, but it got up? 
I think, you know, when you, when you look back to federation, we weren't talking about one section of 100 words. We were talking about 128 sections in a constitutional document. We were dealing with a population with much more rudimentary education than Australians have today. We were dealing with populations that didn't have all the access to communications technology that we do today. And yet you didn't hear, if you don't know, vote no. It wasn't an argument that was there. And yet that is the sort of essence of some of the no campaign here, that if we don't know, vote no. Um, I think um, that, of, of course, there were things that could have been done differently in relation to, uh, to, to how, this, uh, how this came about. But I think when people focus on the words and the question, that's all I'd ask Australians to do, is to focus on the words and the question, because that's the thing that is going to change. The words in the amendment to the Constitution, that's the thing that's going to change. People will see, as two former Chief Justices of this state have said, as I think uh, by, by my count at least three former judges of the High Court, including the former Chief Justice of Australia, have said, that this is a safe change. And this is something that I think will improve the lives of Indigenous Australians. I've got a couple of Zoom questions. We'll go here in a minute. Uh, but I've got one from Launceston, someone who, who's in the yes camp, but says, do you think, well, you can't do anything about it, of course, that it went on too long, that we've never had a referendum that's sort of been in the in the air for 18 months or close to 18 months. Has that been a problem or, well, or I, not? I, I'm a strong constitutional monarchist, Jared, and that, ref that Republic referendum was in the air since 1992 and we ended up voting on it in 1999. So um, I, I think referenda have to, uh, to take time to germinate. I think one of the challenges is that there are people who are highly focused on the referendum and there are many Australians who still don't know that they're going to have to vote on the 14th of October at their local school and are wondering what this is all about. So there's never, a, there's never an ideal time. What's the system that the framers of the Constitution set up? They set up this wonderfully, uh, wonderful country with a, with, a, with a great thing that we have in this country that we should always be proud of wherever we sit on this debate, and that is that we, the Australian people, get to choose whether our rule book changes. And the framers of the Constitution asked us only to do one thing, to be informed about that change. And that's what uh, the process is all about. It's about giving people the time to find the information so that they can cast an informed vote whether they vote yes or no. You're preaching to the converted here, so you don't have to convert me. I suspect not everyone, Ruth, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of you to say. Um, I'm just wondering about the campaign and why didn't you bite back when it was, if you don't know, uh, vote no. Why didn't you say a simple thing like, if you, if you vote no, you'll never know, or something simple like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I'm, I'm not in charge of campaign slogans. That's not really my strong yeah. suit. But I, I have been critical of that as an argument because I do think it disrespects, um, you know, the great privilege that we have as Australians that so few countries in the world have that the framers of the Constitution gave us, which is to get informed about, uh, about the debate. And there's lots of information out there from the yes side and the no side. And, um, you know, if people have a read of the question and they have a read of the words in, in, the, uh, in the amendment, they have a read of the booklet that came to all, all Australian households from the Australian Electoral Commission that puts the yes and the no case. That's people doing their, their, their due diligence and exercise their grey matter. The arguments they're hearing, do they, do they appeal? Do they make sense? Do they think that, that they'll make, uh, make the changes or do they think that they will, um, uh, you know, uh, fan the fears that people are, are, are raising. Those are the things that all of us as Australians need to do. Julian, uh, Peter Graham. You're a voice for the people in the electorate of Barara. Because of Section 28 of the Constitution, you're there for a maximum term of three years. Because of Section 40, you have an equal vote with the other 150 voices representing the other electorates. You're there because you satisfy at least six rules in Sections 34, 42, 44 uh, of, and 40, I think, of the Constitution. You're over 21, you're an elector entitled to vote. You were, when elected, a resident of Australia for at least three years. You're a subject of the King coming. Uh, you have sworn an oath or affirmation of allegiance and you're not disqualified because of criminal activity. Why should the people, why should the people create a new constitutional voice body for which there are no such rules? Peter, thank you for, for the question. I think the first thing to say is that my job as a parliamentarian is to make decisions. It's to vote on legislation. It is, if I'm ever selected to be a minister, to administer a department. 
Those are the duties of being a, a member of parliament. It's to represent my community in that regard. What we're setting up with The Voice is a group of people to advise. Their job is not to make decisions. They're not, their job is not to legislate. Their job is definitely not to administer. Their job is to provide advice to parliament, advice to ministers, advice to public service. It's a different role. The, the rules for how The Voice will be established um, are there. Um, the power to establish those rules is there in paragraph three of the amendment, which says that the, the parliament will be responsible for the composition, functions, powers and procedures of The Voice. And it's a strength of the amendment that they can be adjusted from time to time. They can be overhauled, they can be reformed, they can be changed. And that's a good thing um, because it allows the parliament the flexibility to experiment with the body um, to meet the conditions that Australia finds itself in. Another question, another question on Zoom, uh, which has now disappeared. Um, yes, the questioner says, <clears throat> I'm not sure where from, an argument made for the voice is that this proportionate number of indigenous Australians in prison and the question is how will the voice help that situation that's a great question um, one of the great projects that uh, has been um, rolled out around australia is a, a particularly in this state is a project called justice reinvest where instead of um, directing um, a lot of the um, justice issues into policing and um, uh, the penitentiary alone um, it focuses on um, the situation Indigenous people find themselves in in their particular community and looks at things like education and health um, and takes a look at these things more holistically. It's been a successful program that's run in western New South Wales in, in, in three towns there and it's um, helping to reduce the prison population in those towns. The benefit of the program and, and why it's been uh, hailed as a, as a success is because it's been developed in consultation, in close consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So the voice would help provide advice on issues like uh, criminal, criminal justice matters in order to try and give the, the government better solutions for how to deal with uh, the incarceration rates um, that are around the country. Uh, and what policies that you can put in place to, uh, to better address those things. Now, with any advisory body, it is up to the government to determine whether it wants to accept the advice, reject the advice, or cherry-pick the advice. But the decisions that government will make uh, will be much stronger for the fact that the government has, has, uh, has heard from a group of Indigenous Australians at the, at the national level that are fed in from the local and regional. Thank you very much. Um, as Gerard mentioned, we had Senator Little talking to the Institute um, only a week or so ago, and she supported the no case. But in her speech, she gave very um, strong examples of failure of service delivery, as have you at the beginning of your speech. So can I take just one of those, which is rheumatic heart disease in young Aboriginals, where young children, young teenagers are actually having major heart surgery? And can I ask you why you think a voice advising parliament or how a voice advising parliament will actually lead to very specific change in something concrete like that, which should be abolished, as you quite rightly said by now? Let me give you a, uh, a, a, an example by analogy. Um, an example by analogy of something that uh, we're listening to Aboriginal people has actually seen positive change in relation to um, health outcomes for Indigenous people. The rates of breast cancer in the indigenous population are very similar to the rates of breast cancer in the general population. Recently I visited the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Service. I was talking to them because although the rates of, of cancer are the same, the rates of death from breast cancer among indigenous women is far, far higher than the rest of the population. And they wanted to work out why Indigenous women were not being screened for breast cancer. Because if you're not being screened, you can't detect breast cancer and you can't do things to try and prevent uh, people dying from breast cancer. They surveyed Indigenous women uh, throughout, the, uh, uh, throughout Victoria and uh, the results were very interesting. Firstly, they found that Indigenous women have real issues about modesty and screening. Secondly, that hospitals for Indigenous women were places of trauma and death and they felt very uncomfortable in them. So they flipped the project on its head. In 12 communities, they created what's known as a beautiful shawl, a shawl that women could wear to get uh, their breast cancer screenings designed with Indigenous motifs that were relevant to the communities the women were coming from. 
Secondly, instead of getting women to come to hospital, they took the breast screenings to community. And the women came out in droves. And so the rates of breast cancer, uh, the rates of women getting screened for breast cancer are far higher now in Victoria than they were as a result of listening uh, and changing policy. The same thing should be able to be applied in relation to rheumatic heart disease. I can't stand here and give you the solution because I haven't spent the time listening to Indigenous people in, in community. But the Victorian example is a great example of where you have a policy failure, people consult with Indigenous people, the policy is changed and you get a better outcome. That's all The Voice will be doing and it will be doing it again and again. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I have a question. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm an undecided voter. It's been very useful listening to you tonight. It's really been helpful. I've been watching the campaign and I agree with you. There's been lots of information and from all different sides. One of the things that I've seen particularly represented by supporters of the no campaign, some supporters, not all, has been a, a lack of civility and some discourteousness, including booing during, during acknowledgements of country. And I, my question is, do you think after the vote that this um, temperature will come down? regardless of the outcome or do you think that some of these poor behaviours will continue because that's been, that's been lit now? The wonderful thing about a vote is that a vote settles a question. So um, regardless of the outcome on the 14th of, of October, Australians will have made their views known about these, about these issues and we as a country will, 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 will move on from that issue. I've always chosen to conduct myself in a civilised manner in, in, in this debate, as I do generally in, in, in public debate. And there are people of goodwill on both sides of this debate, uh, and I want to acknowledge that. And I want to acknowledge that for many people on the no side of the debate, uh, they, they are coming to this as reasonable Australians who have concerns. And I, and I respect that, and I respect their right to vote no. Um, just as I know there are people on the yes case who, uh, who, have a, uh, uh, who believe that this will make a big difference to the lives of Indigenous Australians. I, I said this in, in the very first speech that I gave this year on this subject to the young Liberals, that those of us on the yes case have to appreciate the concerns and questions of those who doubt, and those on the no case have to understand <coughs> the legitimate aspirations of, uh, of Indigenous Australians uh, for this to make a difference in their lives. And I think that's the important thing here. Julian, um, I'm a proud no voter and I pay my respects to Captain Arthur Phillip, without whom I wouldn't be here today. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jared. Um, we, we know about the West Farmers decision. We know about the, the West Australian legislation. That's why people are very fearful of what will happen with a voice. We have a left-wing House of Representatives, Parliament. We have a left-wing Senate. And you're telling me the Parliament will decide I am fearful that a left-wing activist group will decide how this carries on. Your, your comment. Well, Jared, the, the wonderful thing about Parliament is that uh, regardless of who's in power, everybody gets a say. And uh, uh, we are going to hold my, – my party will hold the, the government to account in relation to, to this. And uh, if my party doesn't like the way – if the referendum's successful and my party doesn't like the way that the body has been uh, designed, we will come in and change the body. And that's the nature of, uh, of this. When, when you vote us in at the next election uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you sound like the sort of person who doesn't uh, want to vote for an Albanese government, nor do I. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's the, the wonderful nature of democracy. Um, I think some people think that, you know, uh, if, if we vote yes, everybody who's not part of the government will just go to sleep and there will be no debate on this and the government will just steamroll through whatever legislation, whatever design they have for this. That is not how the parliament works. There will be parliamentary committee processes. There will be amendments moved. There will be the full participation of all, of all parliamentarians in this, in this issue, as there should be. And as I say, from time to time, uh, the parliament will change what this body does to adapt to the changing circumstances of Australia. That's the, the benefit of our democracy with its free and fair elections, that from time to time, you have one party that comes in and does one thing and another party that comes in and says, we don't like what they've done, vote for us and we'll change it. And that's the beauty of our system. 
So we've got a question from Canberra. Do you, do you believe that, it is said that Indigenous people will push harder for a treaty and reparations if the voice referendum is passed. And the question is, do you think that's a correct assessment or not a correct assessment? Well, let me be very clear. There's only one thing on the ballot paper and that is the voice. Those are the hundred or so words that I read to you earlier that will be added to the Constitution. It has nothing to do with treaty, it has nothing to do with reparations. There are people on the no side who are very firmly in favour of treaty, like Warren Mundine. There are people on the yes side who are very, uh, and uh, Lydia Thorpe. There are people on the yes side who are opposed to treaty uh, and reparations and the like. So I, d I think we need to look at the issues very separately and look at what is on the table today. There's only one thing on the table today, and that is the voice. Um, a similarly directed but uh, different question, which asks your opinion on the issue that the voice will lead to legal challenges in the courts, leading to policy making by activist courts. Is that a proposition you agree with or disagree with? Well, let me say this. Uh, to quote from the former Chief Justice of New South Wales, Tom Bathurst, if there's a dispute between the Parliament and the voice, the Parliament wins. Simple as that, and that is clear from the third paragraph in the amendment that we're voting on. Um, so I, I don't believe that, uh, that we're going to see a flood of challenges. Um, I don't believe that the challenge, if there are challenges that they will be successful. Um, it is up to the Parliament to determine how the representations that are made by The Voice are dealt with. Um, the Parliament set up the process and if the Parliament, the Ministers and the bureaucracy comply with that process, there's nothing to see here. Just uh, on, a, on, on your own position, um, you've been very brave, you resigned from the, from the Shadow Cabinet and uh, not many people do that in politics. And, you accepted the consequences. Uh, how is life in the in the Liberal Party? You've got you've got people. On, <laughs> how are you getting on with your colleagues? Do you know one of the loveliest things about uh, uh, what happened to uh, uh, to me on the day that I that I resigned is the number of um, nice messages that I received from colleagues in Canberra from across the party room, particularly the colleagues who who most strongly disagree with me on this, who said, Julian, we disagree with you on this, but We've got to have people in our party room that stand for something. And they admired the fact that I'd taken a stand on this issue just as they might take a stand on another issue. One of the great strengths of our party, and I think we forget this, is that we are the party that stands for freedom and conscience. Those are the two most important values that we have. And unlike the Labor Party, where everyone who comes into the Labor Party room must sign the pledge, and the pledge is that you will always be bound by decisions of the caucus. So if I had been a Labor member and done what I had done, I would have been expelled from my party. That is not the tradition in our party. In our party, the tradition is that the members of the front bench are bound by the decisions of the, um, uh, the, the party room and, uh, and the front bench of the shadow cabinet or the cabinet, but the back benches are free to campaign on issues as they see fit. And um, that is a decision, that is a, a principle that pre long predates the Liberal Party and goes back to all its antecedents, as, uh, as you know well. And um, I have to say that uh, uh, one of the things that I think I've been helpful in relation to this debate is a number of colleagues have had me to their electorates or to participate in fora in relation to this where they can show to their electorates that there are Liberals with different views on, on these issues. And so I've, I hope I've played a useful role in that regard. Um, and I also want to say in the presence of uh, some members of my own conference here that uh, I want to thank my conference for its ongoing support. Uh, I had a meeting of the Liberal Party in Barara called seven days uh, after I'd made my decision. I stood up, I explained my decision. People, it was a very well attended meeting and uh, people uh, overwhelmingly uh, endorsed my right to, uh, to freedom and conscience. And even those people who disagreed with me endorsed the stand that I've taken, the ability to take the stand. And I think that's part of the great tradition of our party. Many thanks. Well, I'm very pleased at the Sydney, at the Sydney Institute in this important debate. We've had, in, in recent weeks, Senator Little and Mr Lisa giving different perspectives in a very intelligent, considered, historically based way. We can form our own opinion, opinions. That's what we're all about. I thank our people in the audience here and those on the Zoom for being respectful. Uh, we've had great discussions. Everyone's behaved themselves, which is nice. And our speakers have been lively, which is nice. Well, nearly everyone's behaved themselves. <laughs> Uh, there you go. You can't win them all. But um, Anne will be putting these papers out. We're going to get these papers out before um, the 14th, with any luck. 
Yeah, there we go. So they'll be in the Sydney Papers online. But for tonight, just to, to Julie and Lisa, well done and good luck. Mm. Thank you.